All right, how you guys doing? We're four days in, so I think I probably need this as much as you guys. I'd like, if you can, everybody just do me a favor. Everybody just stand up where you are. Raise your hands. I've been in meetings and stuff. Raise your hands. Just jump and wave your hands. Now let out a little woo! Woo! Now turn to the guy, person next to you, high five. Other person next to you, high five. If you're a hugger, give him a hug. If you're not, stand back. All right, see all the guys are like, women are like, oh, come in. Guys are like. All right, everybody sit down. We're going to do some crazy stuff. And uh, actually, the lady, I, I just arrived from, I was taping this podcast up until now. I just arrived a few minutes ago. Uh, the woman in the back said, uh, you know, do you have your, uh, do you, I just want to check, no audio, no stuff, no video, no audio, no stuff. I was like, I've got 300 slides of data and done, and she's, the look on her face was like a heart attack. So just to be clear, there's no slides, no data dump, just a couple of stories, a couple of crazy ideas. I don't want to look at any more slides, data. I did get an instruction for questions at the end. Go to slido.com, and we are, someone want to tell me what room? Salon H, Salon H, slido.com, South by Southwest for questions. All right, we're going to talk about some crazy ideas, and I'm going to start with a question. This is a glass of water I can stick my finger in, and I can swish it around. I can do that for any liquid. My finger just swishes around, the molecules slosh around, except when I gradually lower the temperature, all of a sudden, at a critical point, the behavior completely changes. I can't stick my finger in anymore. Why? They've gone from totally sloshing around to completely rigid, to ice. But the molecules inside are exactly the same. So how did they know to suddenly change? There's no CEO molecule sitting there saying, well, I, I think the temperature is 33, so everybody be a liquid, and with a bullhorn, and no, let me check, I think it's 31, everybody go rigid. They just suddenly change. So what I'm going to tell you about today is how understanding the answer to that question helped the Allies win the Second World War, helped the U.S. lead the world in science and technology ever since, and gives us a new way to think about the behavior of groups, about the nature of innovation, and what it means to be a great leader. And I'm going to leave you with three rules that you can use with your teams or companies or if you're a solo entrepreneur, three rules you can use. And as a bonus, there's time. I'm going to show you how that same set of answers to that question, the same set of ideas, helps us understand world history, why the world speaks English. We're going to do all that in 45 minutes. You ready? And so I needed the jump. I needed some energy to get this going. All right, here we go. First, why the Second World War? So my background is I'm a scientist by training. I studied physics uh, for many years, and I ended up in the business world. First, I did some consulting. I worked with investment banks, private equity shops for a couple years. And then I started a biotech company developing new drugs for treating cancer. I ran that for uh, about six or seven years as a private company, took it public, ran it for another six or seven years as a public company. And so what am I doing talking about the Second World War, and what am I doing talking about a glass of water? So that started about eight years ago. I got a phone call from a professor that I used to be a, a teaching assistant for in college. And he said, uh, Safi, I work now with President Obama's Council of uh, Science Advisors, and we have a project. It's a project is to think about the future of national research. How should we shape how the country invests in science and technology? And uh, I'd like to know if you'd be interested in, in helping us. So after I got over, like, you got to be kidding. Me, like, I don't know anything about politics or political science or science policy or actually history for that matter. I was kind of running a company. I had blinders on for many years. Uh, I agreed. 
And I went down, and by the way, I should add as a footnote, for those of you who are not familiar with the Council of Science Advisors, every president since Franklin uh, Roosevelt has had a Council of Science Advisors to advise on important issues of national uh, security or economy or national well-being as they relate to science and technology or climate change, uh, except for two. One is Richard Nixon, the other is our current president. I'm not going to make any comment, I'm just putting that out there. So, I was invited, phone call, I'm invited, I go down to Washington, D.C., I'm kind of excited, there are all these august people there, all these sort of Nobel laureates, university presidents, and then just me, I have no idea what I'm doing there. But anyway, uh, I was asked, I was told, we were told the first day, your mission is to write the next generation of the Vannevar Bush report. What should the future of the nation and science and technology look like for the next 50 years. Unfortunately, I had no idea who Vannevar Bush was or what his report was. And we had three, a small group of us had three months to write this recommendation uh, for the president. So I did some fast reading. And that's why I'm going to talk to you a little bit about lessons we can learn from World War II and how we can extrapolate those lessons. So first, who is Vannevar Bush? He was the engineer who helped turn the course of the war. And now when I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story or the histories and what we can take away from that today, I want to ask you to do something that you don't commonly hear, but is incredibly important if you want to take away lessons from history. And that is to forget everything you know or think you know about World War II. And I want you to imagine going back in time to 1939, before the start of the war, early January 1939. Forget about the outcomes, all the movies you've seen. Imagine that you're there in 1939, and someone asks you, who would you put your money on? The United States, the Allies, or Nazi Germany? At the time, January 1939, Nazi Germany had developed these things called U-boats, these submarines that looked ready to strangle the Atlantic, cut off all communication, which they nearly did for four years of the war. They had built up these remarkable planes that outclassed any other plane that any of the Allied forces had. It was part of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, which looked ready to bomb Europe into submission, which they did in the first few weeks of the war. And then in January 1939, two German scientists developed something called nuclear fission. They discovered how to split the atom. And that put Hitler within reach of the most dangerous weapon ever created by mankind. So if you were a betting person, you would have been absolutely correct to bet on Germany. Vannevar Bush, at the time, was dean of engineering at MIT, and he was an incredible inventor. He invented the first computer, the first analog computer. He invented many of the ideas behind what eventually became the personal computer industry and the internet. He was an incredible entrepreneur. He started a company now called Raytheon. And he'd also worked enough with the military to know that we were in a very deep crisis. And he'd heard a lot from German refugee scientists, Jewish scientists, to know that we were far behind. So he quit his job. He'd built up MIT to the leading technology university in the world. And he was kind of an organizational genius, and the president of MIT knew it. But when he told the president, I'm going to quit my job and move to Washington, because we're in a national crisis, and that's where I can best help, the president of MIT said, listen, I will resign as president and make you president if you stay. This university needs you. He said, no. Quitting my job, he moved to Washington and talked his way into a meeting with FDR. It was a 10-minute meeting. That 10-minute meeting probably changed the course of, war, of the war more than any other 10-minute meeting during the war. And he handed FDR a single sheet of paper with three small paragraphs in the middle. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about. What did he do? What did he say? So to come back to this glass of water and why I asked you this question. What did Bush understand? Bush understood 
that the uh, water can exist in two phases. You have a solid phase and a liquid phase, and the transition between them is something fascinating and is very important to groups. So let me explain that to you. Let me explain. It's called a phase transition. And let me explain every phase transition in nature to you in 90 seconds. In the case of water, we're trying to understand why does water suddenly change behavior when there's no CEO? And that's going to come back and be something very interesting for the behavior of groups and for innovation in groups. So I'm going to explain every phase transition in 90 seconds. Every phase transition is a result of a tug of war between two competing forces. In the case of water, one of them is entropy, which wants to make the, wants to make the molecules run around and be free, slosh around. The other is binding energy that wants to make them lock rigidly in place. Every molecule, exactly 2.8 angstroms, not 2.7 or 2.9 from the other one. And as you change temperature, the relative strength of these two things slowly changes. And all of a sudden, at a critical point, boom, at 32 Fahrenheit, they cross. And the system snaps. And it becomes completely rigid. It's nothing to do with any molecule shouting, be fluid or be rigid. It has to do with an element of structure. So Bush understood that there are these elements of structure that are enormously important to the behavior of groups. You slosh around, and we're going to see why that translates to being innovative and fluid, or you're rigid, execution and operational excellence. And what he also understood is that transition is not fixed. You can control it. So water freezes at 32 Fahrenheit, right? Well, not always. What happens when it snows overnight? What do you sprinkle on your sidewalks? OK, this is very quiet. I, I heard a few hands. Actually, I, when I do this in New England, it's like everybody raises their hand, salt! Yeah, I realize I'm in Austin, and like there's no snow, so nobody knows. I, I did this in Southern California, and they were like, no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, all right, you sprinkle salt. Why do you sprinkle salt on your sidewalk? It lowers that fr freezing temperature. Here's another example. Iron. When you take iron, raw iron is a very weak metal. You add a tiny little bit of carbon. What happens to it? Exa someone's a chemical engineer. It turns into steel. Add a little bit of nickel and tungsten. What happens? It turns into the super strong alloys you use inside jet engines and nuclear reactors. So that's what we will learn how to do with teams and companies. We identify those small changes in structure that can transform a team. So this is what Bush realized. And it gives us a different way of thinking about the world around us. For example, when I was an early entrepreneur, I would get around like a lot of entrepreneurs do for drinks at the end of the day. And we'd pat each other on the back. You know, we're, All the great innovations are going to come from us, from people like us. Because we are the true entrepreneurs, we are risk takers, and all those big corporate guys are risk averse. That's why the great ideas come from little companies. But there was this funny, weird thing that as you grow up and I started to mature as an entrepreneur and my friends matured, as an entrepreneur, we started working with those big corporate guys. And eventually we started hiring them and they joined us. And as soon as we would go to, they loved new stuff just as much as us, every one of them. And as soon as they joined us, boom, off would come the tie, off would come the suit jacket, and they'd be pounding the table over some wild idea just like the rest of us. They were just like the rest of us. And that's kind of one of the first interesting insights here is that it's not about the individual, it's not about a CEO. There's something about structure of teams and companies that make them either wildly innovative and embrace new ideas or be rigid and focused on operations and execution. So, what do I mean by that? Take a molecule of water. Drop it onto a block of ice. What happens? It freezes. Take the same molecule of water, drop it into a pool of liquid. It sloshes around. But it's the same molecule. That's just like all of us. We might be either wildly, all of us have the part where we can be incredibly focused on operation and execution and discipline, or wildly and innovative. It's not that we're fundamentally risk averse or fundamentally risk taking. 
It's something about the structure, something about the temperature. So let's get at that. But back to World War II, what did Bush do? Bush understood that the military men that he was working with loved new gadgets and new technology just like he did, but they rejected them every time. And that's why we were in danger of losing the Second World War. So there, the problem is, in any team or any company, you can't be, or any system, you can't be in two phases at the same time. You can't be water and ice at the same time. It doesn't make sense. A team can't be wildly innovative, crazy new ideas, and totally focused on operation at the same time. It's impossible, with one exception. Right at 32 Fahrenheit. What happens at 32 Fahrenheit? That's life at the edge of a phase transition. If you bring a bathtub to 32 Fahrenheit, what happens? You get something called phase separation. You get blocks of ice and pools of liquid. Blocks of ice and pools of liquid. And what happens there? It's not static. This is the most important thing that people often miss. It's not static. Molecules in the pool of liquid will spin up. We're getting to World War II. Molecules in this pool of liquid will swim by the block of ice, they'll lock on and they'll freeze. Then they'll melt off the block of ice and they'll go back into the pool of liquid. And they'll go back and forth and back and forth. That's called in science dynamic equilibrium. So the way to do both is create life at 32 Fahrenheit, life at the edge of a phase transition. So what did Bush do? I'm going to give you an example. He, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to come back to the example. I'll tell you what he did with FDR. With FDR, he said, Mr. President, we're going to lose this war because Nazi Germany is far ahead of us. I need you to do the following thing. I need you to authorize a new group within the federal government, and I will mobilize, and that will report to me, and I will report only to you, and I will mobilize the nation's science, scientists and technologists to develop these crazy new weapons. We're going to be totally separate from the military. That was the first step, phase separation. We created a totally separate group that would just do the crazy new weapons. So what came of it? How many of you have seen the movie, the Benedict Cumberbatch movie, where code breaking helps win World War II? How many of you have seen that movie? Wow. Almost everybody has seen that movie. I'm going to say this right up front. I think he's a great actor. Uh, Keira Knightley's in the movie. I think she's a great actress. It's an awesome movie. It's based on a lie. Code breaking had nothing to do with the bat winning the Battle of the Atlantic or the battle against the U-boats. In reality, what was left out of the movie in most popular books, yes, it is true, Benedict Cumberbatch, who played Alan Turing, a mathematician, helped contribute to breaking some German codes. Yes, it is true that the Germans did not know that, at least for a while. But what's omitted is that the Germans also had 1,000 people in their intelligence group called B. Deinst working on breaking the British codes, and they had actually done a far better job, and they'd been reading essentially every British transcript, intercepting it, and decoding it, and so they had all the information about what the British ships were doing. So as soon as British ships heard the German codes and moved, the U-boats would move and sink them two days later. So code breaking actually played almost no role in the Battle of the Atlantic. And in fact, if you look at the data, you know, one million ships lost in 1939, four million, uh, four million tons of shipping lost in 40, four million tons in 41, eight million tips. U-boats were sinking Allied ships faster than the Allies could build them. England, the code breaking was in 40 and 41, and it obviously didn't make any difference because it kept going up. England, by the spring of 1943, had three months of oil left. Just think of that. You're in the middle of World War. What do tanks run on? What do ships fly on? Oil. Churchill and Roosevelt didn't talk about that publicly, but they were both incredibly aware, and they both realized that the turning point of the war would be that battle of the Atlantic, the battle with the U-boats. In an eight-week period, between March of 1943 and May of 1943, Allied shipping went, losses went down 95%. They plunged. Why? 
nothing to do with code breaking. One new technology was introduced. I'm simplifying a little bit, but the key technology was something called microwave radar. Microwave radar, radar has many different frequencies and radio wavelength radar is very big and unfortunately wasn't very useful to spot tiny little submarines and periscope. When, the, when Bush's group, quarantine group of scientists in Boston, some secret buildings near MIT, developed microwave radar, the first planes that flew out in March of 1943 all of a sudden could see the U-boats. Whereas before, they were invisible. They would just appear in a wolf pack, shoot down the convoys, and disappear. All of a sudden, they could see them. And it became like shooting fish in a barrel. Germany lost one-third of its U-boat fleet in the first four weeks. Four weeks later, the head of the German Navy, Hitler, and the head of the German Navy had by then come to believe that the U-boats would win World War II for them. On May 20th, the head of the German Navy declared defeat. He withdrew all of the U-boats, all of them, for the Atlantic. And the lanes were open to resupply Europe and for an invasion of Europe. And then the war turned. So where did that come from? It came from this crazy ideas being developed by Vannevar Bush. And so what are the important lessons there? A lot of people understand, how do we fast forward to teams and company? A lot of people understand the ideas that uh, building an innovation lab, separating your artists and your soldiers. But most of those innovation labs fail. Why? Because they miss the second part, which is the transfer. Nobody wanted to use radar at first, and Bush called the Secretary of War and said, listen, put this guy, I want you to fly in a plane, you to use it, you can see these things, this is amazing. Secretary of War wrote all his generals, I've seen radar, why haven't you? They started using it. But what it, almost, it, some people get that, that you need to transfer from the artist to the soldiers. You need to tra people think their artists create these beautiful ideas. They think, oh, everybody's going to want to use it. No. The soldiers, the people like in the real, in the business world, you have developed this great new product. You know what the marketers, the marketers are paid on commission. The great new products never work very well the first time. They flop or they have these problems. Customers have to learn it. They want the, same, they want the thing that they're used to. So they're not really motivated. So you have to manage the transfer. That's where most innovation fails, is the transfer. But not just one way. Most important is the transfer the other way, and that's what almost everybody misses. What do I mean? The group in Boston, the, the scientists in Boston, developed microwave radar. And they got on some buildings in Boston. They said they could, they discovered they could see U-boats in Boston Harbor, and they celebrated. This is awesome. They gave it to the pilots. Nothing happened. For half a year, for a year, nothing happened. So this is where Bush stepped in again and said, Let's, what's going on? We need transfer in the other direction. We need that dynamic. What happened? He told, he said, listen, you guys in the lab, get in the planes. I want you to get in the cockpit with these pilots and figure out what happened. They got in the plane. They realized when they're flying 300, 400 miles an hour and they're being shot at, they didn't have time to fiddle with a, you know, 13 different switches on these black box red. The technology worked, they realized, but their user interface was lousy. The user interface was lousy. So they went back in the lab and they created this thing, this oscilloscope with this, this sweeping line and the dots. They gave it to the pilots and boom. That was March 1943. Within eight weeks, the war had turned. So what are the lessons from this story for the business world? What are the lessons for us today? So this sounds like, oh, well, maybe it's just the military. And so actually, Bush got his ideas from the business world. Where? Four decades earlier, there was another big franchise in crisis. World War II was an example of a big franchise in crisis. The US military, far behind Nazi Germany in innovation. It was an example of a big franchise in crisis because of a failure to innovate. Four decades earlier, there was another big franchise in crisis called the Bell Telephone Company. What happened? 
What happened was Alexander Graham Bell invented this great, great, crazy new technology, terrific technology. You see this story play out so many times recently. I'm just going to tell this, this story because it kind of epitomizes so many of them. Developed this great new technology called the telephone. Created this company, the Bell Telephone Company. And the board of directors that he worked with, which was these sort of rich, older Boston Brahmins, decided this was great. We have a monopoly because of his patent. And they just started milking his patent. Some people wanted to do crazy new things and eventually, no, nope, we just want to milk the patent, take our checks. Eventually, the patent expired. And by 1907, it was a mess. All these little companies had started. Bell Telephone Company was falling down the toilet. Everybody was angry because their quality was going down. The service didn't work very well. All these new competitors were coming up and eating their lunch. And a guy named J.P. Morgan said, this is crazy. He bought a bunch of the stock, took over the company, fired the board of directors, and installed a guy named Theodore Vail. Theodore Vail realized franchise in crisis I got to do something dramatic. He gets up, one of his first speeches, he said, we are going to offer the nation something it's never had before. One system, one service, one policy from New York to California. You will be able to place a phone call. He said, that's impossible. The electron had just been discovered a few years earlier. Quantum mechanics had not yet been discovered. It would be about 15 years away. And you could barely carry a signal over a line a small fraction of that distance, and no one could explain why. No one inside the company thought he could do it. But he did. How did he do it? He created a quarantine group of artists working on fundamental technologies. They developed the first amplifier. Fast forward, 1915, gets Alexander Graham Bell out of retirement, gets an office in New York, brings Bell to his office, Another office in San Francisco gets Watson, Dr. Watson. You remember the first phone call, if you may remember, was between Bell and Watson. Come over here, I need you. They were in a, the same Boston building. Now Watson's in California. Alexander Bell picks up the phone. President of the United States is on the line, and he says, Dr. Watson, I need you. Watson says, it would take me a week to get to you this time. He solved the problem. He created what was now known as Bell Labs. Eight Nobel Prizes, the transistor, the CCD chip. So many great inventions came out of Bell Labs. The head of Bell Labs during World War II is a guy named Frank Jewett. Frank Jewett was Vannevar Bush's mentor. He joined Bush as one of the key people on his team. So these ideas come from the business world. What are the lessons for us today? And I'm going to tell you, it's not just for us, but it's for nations. Why? The system that Bush set up and the principle he used for innovation and the Vannevar Bush report, which I eventually discovered, underlies essentially all of the national research, infra the national research infrastructure of the United States. National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, DARPA in the military, the many other DARPAs, all came out of Bush's system. What did that give us? I give us the biotechnology industry, the chemotherapy cure for cancer, GPS, essentially the personal computers, internet, even the Siri in your iPhones was sponsored by, first sponsored by federal research. The Google search algorithm was first sponsored by federal research. All of those things sprang out of Vannevar Bush's system. So we've shown you a little bit about how understanding what happens inside of glass of water gives us how it helped the Allies win the Second World War and how it helped the US lead the world in science and technology. But what does it tell us about leadership? Three things. Number one, I'm going to give, I only remember things with like visual mnemonics. So number one, ice cube. Life at 32 Fahrenheit. You want to achieve a balance between your artists and your soldiers. Neither one overwhelming the other. And you want a constant exchange. Separation, but constant exchange. Number two, there's this myth that the great leader is a sort of innovative technologist with these brilliant inventions, and he builds, he or she builds this amazing company on the back of his or her inventions. 
But that's a myth. The great leaders, the ones like Vannevar Bush, they didn't lead like a Moses standing on the top of a mountain, raising their staff, saying, this is the holy I idea, this is the loon shot, the crazy idea that is going to work and part the seas, everybody make way. That's not really what they did. Bush, even though he was a brilliant engineer, made a great point of saying, I contributed zero to the technology. My job was managing the transfer. I managed the balance between these two groups. I didn't pick which one. You just nurture them. You make sure the ideas come out not too early, not too late. You nurture these two groups. So number one, create life at 32 Fahrenheit. Number two, be a gardener, not a Moses. Your job, if you're a manager or your leader, is to nurture the balance between these two groups. Number three, I've been talking a little bit more about hard science, and this is actually not just a metaphor. You can write down the equations and calculate what are the key parameters that you can adjust. But this may sound soft and fuzzy, but it's probably the most important lesson. Love your artists and soldiers equally. What do I mean by that? Well, especially we're here at South by Southwest, and there's an enormous focus on technology. And if you go to Silicon Valley, it's technology, technology, product, product, technology. And there's a lot of distrust. There's a lot of often hostility between the people who are creating the beautiful new technology and the soldiers, the marketers, or the regulatory, or the product people, or the ex who are manufacturing it or delivering it to customers on time. And these two are two very different groups. And they don't speak often the same way. They use the same words, but those words mean very different things. They have very different smells. Risk. Everybody knows what the words risk mean. But if you're an innovator, if you're doing something wildly creative, you want risk. You want to try, ten, you want to try hundreds of new ideas and fail them quickly and see which couple work. If you are manufacturing, risk is a bad word. It's the same English but different meaning. You want to minimize. So for example, if you're creating the crazy new technologies to put inside planes that can give you an advantage over your, your enemy, you want to try lots of different things, people, things that people say will never work. But if you're assembling those planes, you don't want to launch 10 planes in the sky and see which eight crash. Oh, they crash. I guess that didn't work. Risk. Artists and soldiers, the same English word as a good versus a bad. So they're speaking different languages. And usually, a leader grows up in one side or the other. Either you're a technology person, and you grow up loving new technologies. And so you favor the crazy technology people, the innovators. How does that make? The people who are working hard, manufacturing, trying to minimize risk feel. Well, they feel like crap. If the CEO at the top or the manager is always talking about, oh, look at this shiny new penny, this shiny new thing, and ignoring. It's all about innovation, innovation. There's all this advice, you know, CEO be the CIO. That's the wrong message. You want to wear one hat of trying lots of crazy stuff with your artists, and you want to wear another hat of excellence and execution, which is just as important. You need both. You need your artists and your soldiers. Just having that, if you imagine a 100-yard football field, just having the idea gets you from your goal line to the five or your five or your 10. All the rest is getting that idea into a product, on time, on budget, on spec. Those are the soldiers. You need both. If you have just innovation, you'll just be stuck on your five-yard line the whole game. You need both working together. Your job as a manager, whether you grew up as an artist or whether you grew up as a soldier, is to love them equally. It's like a parent. For those of you who are parents, I'm just actually curious because I haven't been to South. How many are parents? OK, it's a little older crowd than the Silicon. You, you, might, have, you might have grown up one way or the other. You have a couple kids. You can't favor one kid because they're more artsy and one kid because they're more into sports. You have to love your kids equally. If you're managing or leading, you have to love both equally. And that's what Vannevar Bush did. There were many scientists 
who tried to influence the military between World War I and World War II. What happened? They failed, every single one of them. Why? They had an attitude. Well, we're the scientists, we're the professors at Harvard or MIT, we know, you guys are just military people. No one's gonna take your ideas if that's how you think about them. Bush, at the end of the war said, I actually prefer the company of military men more than academics or anyone else. They've learned courtesy, they've learned teamwork, they're a pleasure to work with. It was the respect, it was loving his artists and soldiers equally that got him to where, got him to achieve what he was able to achieve, which saved the Allies, which turned the course of World War II. So here are the three rules again. Number one, create life at 32 Fahrenheit. I'm, going to, I'm talking a little bit about larger companies. I'm going to come back to, I mean, the question is, how do you translate this if you're a solo or a small company? Number one, life at 32 Fahrenheit, which means separate and create dynamic exchange, both directions. Number two, be a gardener, not a Moses. And number three, love your artists and soldiers equally. Okay. That's what it has to do that's what the glass of water tells us about how the Allies won World War II, how it helped the U.S. lead the world in science and technology innovation ever since, and how it gives us a new way to think about being innovative managers and leaders. So now I'm going to do a sort of a step out a moment and actually come back to the title of this talk. Why, do I, why is it called Loon Shots? Why is it called loon shots with an L. Everybody knows what a moonshot is. A moonshot is a big goal that everybody gets excited about. But the big ideas that change our world, the really important ideas that transform science or business or even world history, aren't announced with blaring trumpets and red carpets. Everyone dazzled by their brilliance. They're usually neglected or dismissed. They're around for a decade or two, not just years, but a decade or two. And their champions are written off as crazy. So that's why, for lack of any better word, I call them a loon shot. When John F. Kennedy in 1961 announced to Congress his goal, his ambition of putting a man on the moon, his original moonshot, he was widely applauded. Four decades earlier, a man named Robert Goddard explained how we might get there. The principles of liquid fuel jet propulsion rockets. What happened when, Rockard, uh, what happened when Goddard invented the idea of a modern rocket? He was widely ridiculed. The New York Times took out an editorial that said, this Dr. Goddard fellow, this professor of physics with his, quote, chair, they literally, had air, they literally had quotes around the word chair like it's a bad thing, chair of physics in this university. He doesn't understand the basic laws of physics that we teach our children every day, namely Newton's laws of action and reaction that rockets can't fly in space. Nothing to push against. So he was ridiculed and dismissed in the U.S., but not in Nazi Germany, which actually built on his ideas and developed the first jets. Fast forward July 11, 1969, the day after the successful launch of the Apollo 11 rocket to the moon, the New York Times issues a retraction. Apparently the laws of physics do not preclude rocketry, and quote, the Times regrets the error. Kennedy's idea was the original moonshot. Goddard's idea was a classic loonshot. Moonshot, loonshot. And if you are in the business of trying to transform an industry or create a new strategy, you want to nurture loonshots. Don't worry about the big goals. You never know where. You want to challenge accepted belief. Loonshots challenge accepted beliefs. 
they do what everyone says can't be done. Everybody gives up. All this sort of fast fail and pivot stuff in Silicon Valley is the wrong answer. It is if you want a quick win. It's the wrong answer if you want a truly deep, important breakthrough, because everyone gives up at the first stumble or the first project failure. You want to persist. At the end of a couple project failures, that's where the true gold is. That's where no one else has ever been. So that's why I call them loon shots. So now, I've told you a little bit about nurturing loon shots inside teams and companies. I told you how that made a difference in national research and how that made a difference in the outcome of a war. I told you how we might translate that into a handful of practical rules. What about world history? Here's, I used to give these sort of fun talks about uh, the arc of human thought, how we understand the world around us, sort of 3,000 years summarized in 45 minutes. So I want to ask you the first one, what is the one idea, I'm going to ask the audience, what is the one idea that has changed the course of human history has changed the course of our species more than any other one idea. By the way, I should just say, I was giving this talk in California a couple weeks ago, and one guy in the back raises his hands and shouts out, weed! <laughs> and just for the record, weed is a product, a drug product. It's not an idea. OK, some ideas. It's a one idea. What did you say, mint? Myth. What, some other ideas? The train, some other idea? What? Agriculture. Agriculture. Domestication of plants. What, what's some other ideas? The iPhone. OK, probably not the iPhone. <laughs> not the iPhone 10, anyway. What? Am I not allowed to say that? It's a thing. What? Fire. The wheel. The wheel. OK. All right, let's, I want to, to answer this question, no, not the iPhone. Um, to answer this question, I want, we want to go back 10 years, 50 years, not 50 years, not 100 years, but millennia, thousands of years. Imagine you're in a tribe and lightning strikes a, a tree next to you. Or a volcano erupts sort of farther away. Or it was a bad drought that year and your crops are destroyed. How do you understand why that happened? You ask your tribal elder, or the divine ruler, or some religious leader. Why? How do we understand this? What's the truth here? But in 17th century Western Europe, plus or minus a few years, a new idea emerged that underlying all the stuff we see in the world around us are universal truths, truths that everyone can access through careful measurement and careful experiment. That idea was radical. It was subversive. If we didn't need divine rulers to ask for truth, what did we need divine rulers for at all? Now that idea, that idea, which now goes by the more modern name, the scientific method, was arguably the mother of all loon shots. It changed our species more than any other idea. It led to identifying natural laws, identifying laws of nature, identifying experiment, identifying combustion properties of gases, developing things like the steam engine, which freed mankind from the limits of muscle or animal power and created an exponential growth in industry. It allowed Western Europe, tiny, almost irrelevant Western European nations to take over the world. So why Western Europe? Why Western Europe? Now, the, this is one of the fascinating things for me to spending the last couple of years on, on history is that so much of what I've been 
told or grew up with history is so wrong, so not what happened. I grew up being told, well, science, the, the birth of the scientific method, basically you have the Greeks, then nothing, then Newton, then boom. We're born, ta-da, and the English are great because the English had Newton. That is so not what happened. The story of that idea, the story of that loon shot, is an incredible 2,000-year multicultural journey. It's a story of Catholic bishops hiring Jews in Toledo, Spain to translate Arab critiques of Greek text into Latin for Germans to read, of Chinese technologies and Indian mathematics and Islamic astronomy, of popes and philosophers and magnets and clocks and blood. It's an incredible journey. At the end of that journey, we had this idea which transformed the world. Why Western Europe? Why Western Europe? For a thousand years, if you look back in history, from a thousand years, from the middle of the first millennium, 500, to the middle of the second, 1500, Western European nations were tiny, irrelevant, backwater piece of the world. 50% of the global GDP was China and India. China and India invented, were so far advanced, China, India, and Islamic science and astronomy and medicine were so far advanced, there was no comparison. So paper and printing had been developed in China a thousand years earlier. The magnetic compass, gunpowder, the mathematics that we use today, India, a lot of the astronomy, in fact, the astronomy that Copernicus used around 1510 or so, many of the most critical mathematical steps were borrowed from Islamic astronomers. They were crucial. Without that, without the Indian mathematics, there would have been no Copernicus, no Copernican theory. So why Western Europe? Actually, this is another crazy fact. For 700 years, the most widely used textbook in Western Europe was an, by Ibn Sina, an Islamic scholar an Islam, who wrote the key medical textbook. And it's not seven years or 70 years. Imagine a textbook today being used for 70 years. Not possible. This one was used for 700 years. Islamic astronomy was the, and science and medicine was the high golden standard. So why Western Europe? To answer this question, I want you to do a mental shift, a mental mindset. We've been talking up until now about nurturing loon shots inside teams and companies. I want to talk about nurturing loon shots inside industries for just one second. Film. Film industries, lots and lots of loon shots, lots of crazy films that nobody said could work, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, James Bond turned down by every studio, Star Wars, crazy. There's this small, struggling, hundreds and hundreds of small production shops, and there are the studio majors, Columbia, Universal, Paramount, which are good at these big franchise things. The next Avengers, the next Transformers. These guys are good at the crazy ideas. You need both. These crazy ideas fail all the time, and if you just had them, the industry would go bankrupt. You need these franchises to fund these guys, and their partnerships, dynamic equilibrium. Phase separation and dynamic e partnerships. These guys come up with the crazy ideas, these guys distribute them. My industry, the biotech industry, drug discovery, Merck, Pfizer, Novartis, there are the Columbia Universal Paramount. They come up with the next statin drug, the next ulcer drug. Then you have the hundreds of poorly funded small biotech companies, kind of like mine, working on crazy new ideas. You need both. If it was just biotech companies like mine, industry would go bankrupt. If it was just these franchises, industry would go stale. All this talk about pharma is evil and the good stuff is biotech, it's a mistake. Love your artists and soldiers. Same with the film industry. Oh, the studios are evil, just doing franchises. The system needs both. Love your artists and your soldiers, both. What does that have to do with the question, why Western Europe? China, Islam, and India 
were the dominant majors of their day. They were the Columbia Universal Paramount. They were the Merck, Pfizer, and Novartis. They were phenomenal at franchises. The, has anybody heard of the Great Wall? Has anybody heard of the Grand Canal? Europe has nothing like that. Why? China was phenomenal at franchises. It advanced mining, advanced agriculture, advanced irrigation. Phenomenal in China for a thousand years. India, Islamic science and medicine and the, the proto-universities that they built in the, between the 9th and the 13th century. Phenomenal. Western Europe had nothing like that. What was Western Europe? There were these tiny feuding little nations. None of them, the average of the top five, their GDP was you know, one or two percent compared to 50 percent for China and India. But they were really good for nurturing loon shots. They were the loon shot nursery of world history. A crazy idea, like Copernicus's idea, that maybe the Earth moves around the sun, not the other way around. Crazy. It was dismissed for 80 years. No one took it seriously. Crazy idea. Or the combustion property of gases. Crazy ideas. When some tiny little king rejected the ideas, they just moved to another one. They moved to another little king that would support them. Just like a biotech CEO who pisses off his board, fire goes to another one. Or a film production company take the funding away, find another funder. Eventually the crazy idea gets out. And that crazy idea, the birth of modern science. And that's why modern science began in Western Europe. It was the loonshot nursery of world history. So, I hope you've learned about how understanding this glass of water tells us something about history, tells us something about innovation, tells us something about why the US led the world in science and technology, gives us a new way of thinking about leadership and innovation. And if there's, I started this with a question. Why? Why do these molecules suddenly change behavior? So if there's one thing I want you all to take away from today, maybe even from South by Southwest, is that sometimes the deepest questions are the simplest questions. Thank you. All right, we have time for just a couple questions, if I read this correctly. Uh, what common characteristics do you find great gardeners share? What gives them the ability to allocate resources better than any other? So that goes back to the appreciation to love your artists and soldiers equally. Actually, an, an example of this, a famous example that somebody, someone that everybody, a very famous example, but a not very famous story, Steve Jobs. When he first started his company, he made fun of the soldiers working on franchises and emphasized all the artists in his company working on the next product, the next Macintosh. And it was kind of a disaster. It created dysfunction between the groups, and Apple was doing very poorly. And that's ultimately why he ended up at leaving, and Apple ended up being saved eventually. But when he came back, he had learned to appreciate both sides. For example, Johnny Ive, who's the ultimate artist who developed a lot of that product design, and Tim Cook, who was known as Attila the Hun of inventory when he was at Compact, his artists and his soldiers. So how do you develop that? You learn to appreciate and love, and you put on different hats when you talk to your artists, you talk about their crazy new ideas. You put on a different hat when you talk to your soldiers. You talk about their excellence in execution. So which companies right now are doing this really well? So let me put that out to the audience. You guys have heard a little bit. Which companies do you guys think are doing this really well? Amazon. Anybody else? Google. Why do you think Amazon's doing it really well? All right, they're, on the one hand, they've found a way to keep coming up with crazy new ideas, but at the same time, they haven't slipped on operational execution. 
They've been doing a very good job on that. Google is doing something very similar with Google X, and there are a couple of their spin-off companies has found a way to do a very good job without slipping on execution. Any other companies you guys think of that are doing it very well? Netflix. I don't know them as much. Are you an insider at Netflix? No. That's right. And they're executing very well, but staying very innovative at the same, same time. What's one industry that you believe needs the most disruption? <laughs> it's a little personal, but probably the publishing industry. <laughs> the, uh, um, I love my publishers, if any of them are listening. But uh, you ask pretty much every author, and publishers are really in a very 20th century, 19th century model. And something's going to happen. I mean, Amazon obviously changed a lot, with, uh, and e-books changed a lot, but not as much as you think. But that industry is being done in the same models and systems that were used 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. All right, I think that's all we have time for. So thanks, everybody. Thanks again for coming.